Well, welcome everyone. Um, we are now live. You did not hear what I just finished saying, but we will go from here and see how, how things progress. So I first of all wanted to thank Andreas for his introduction, if you were able to hear that, and to all of the organizers for putting together this venue, which has been really fantastic way for us to continue to do science and to interact with one another. So here we all are spread across the globe, staring at our computer screens in our home offices, our living rooms, our bedrooms, maybe even our bathrooms, trying to wait for some fellow in Colorado to start talking about red squirrels. Well, why are we doing this? Why are we all here uh, looking at our computer screens? We're here because we have a desire to continue to learn but also because we feel a need to maintain some forms of social connection despite the physical distances between all of us now during this pandemic. And the reason that we crave these social interactions is because humans are very social species and science inherently is a social process. And given the importance of these social interactions to humans and science, it's really quite surprising then that most of the time when we think about evolution by natural selection, we ignore these social interactions and we treat individuals as though they are completely socially isolated from one another. When we tend to study evolution by natural selection, we're oftentimes interested in the influence of an individual's genotype or network of genes on their phenotype and how those phenotypic differences translate into differences in fitness. And so this genotype phenotype map that connects genotype to phenotype through the process of development is fundamental to the way we mostly think about evolution by natural selection. And we do this because if we understand something about how genotypes influence phenotypes and how phenotypes influence fitness through natural selection, that we can make some predictions about how genotypes and phenotypes might change across generations. But there's an important component to this puzzle that's missing from this schematic. And that's the contribution of the environment to phenotypes. And in some cir circumstances, it's okay to ignore these environmental influences on phenotypes because they don't contribute to evolutionary change. When the environment is not reliably passed across generations, we can ignore these environmental contributions if we're interested in evolutionary changes across generations. But as soon as individuals interact with one another socially, this is no longer the case. And this clean dichotomy between genotype and the environment starts to fall apart. And this is because the environment experienced by an individual is made up in part of other individuals with their own phenotypes and their own genotypes. And so the genotypes of these other social partners then have the potential to influence the focal animal's phenotype through their social interactions. So if, for example, we are interested in the growth rates of these piglets, we might be interested in how important their own genotype is to their own growth rate, but clearly the mother provides important contributions to the early environment of their life. And as a result, these social interactions have the capacity to contribute to the evolution of those offspring traits. For example, the uh, amount of milk that the mother provides could have big influences on how quickly the piglets grow. And if milk production is then heritable, the genes in the mother for her milk production have the capacity to influence the rate at which her offspring grow through these maternal genetic effects. And maternal genetic effects are uh, one form of social effect that has been known about for quite some time in the animal production literature. Animal breeders got interested in maternal genetic effects because some traits were found to be quite resistant to improvement. And this led to further investigation of the role that mothers and their genes might play 
in the uh, potential response of offspring traits. So some of this early theory goes back to the 1940s, um, but it didn't get into the evolutionary literature until the late 1980s with some models by Kirkpatrick and Landy. And when we think about how social effects um, can influence evolutionary change, we can oftentimes do this using or looking through the lens of quantitative genetics. So in quantitative genetics, if we ignore the influences of social interactions, we can think of um, the heritability of a particular trait as being the proportion of total variation in the trait that is determined by the additive effects of that individual's genes on its own phenotype. And as a proportion, the heritability typically ranges between zero and one and just provides a measure of the adaptive potential of that trait or how efficiently selection on that trait will be converted into evolutionary change. When we consider the influence of maternal genetic effects to this adaptive potential, the equation gets a little bit more complicated. Now we have the influence of offspring genes, but we also have this additional influence of maternal genes to overall adaptive potential. At first glance, you might think that given that we are adding in more genetic effects that um, heritability estimates that ignore maternal genetic effects might tend to just underestimate adaptive potential. But this isn't always the case because of this last term in the equation, which represents the association between the offspring genes and the maternal genes. This is a covariance term. And as a result, it's not required to be entirely positive. It can be positive or negative. So in the case of a positive association, in this case that I gave you with the piglets, fast uh, genes, uh, uh, enhancing offspring growth might be positively associated with milk production, leading to offspring that grow even faster. And as a result, in that scenario, we would have increased adaptive potential as a result of the maternal genetic effects. But the exact opposite scenario could also be true. Offspring genes enhancing growth could be associated with uh, genes reducing milk production in which case these two effects would tend to cancel one another out and we would in fact have less adaptive potential as a result of these uh, maternal genetic influences on their offspring. So I was interested in these maternal genetic effects as a PhD student and so I did some cross fostering experiments with red squirrels uh, in the Yukon Territory of Canada, where I climbed up into the spruce trees and temporarily removed the pups from their nests and moved some pups around to try and disentangle the contributions of direct genetic effects from maternal effects. And what I found in these experiments was that uh, offspring growth uh, was in fact heritable, but experienced really strong maternal effects. And these maternal genetic effects, in fact, were positively associated with offspring genetic effects, meaning offspring with the genes for fast growth tended to have mothers with the genes for maternal care that further enhanced offspring growth. And this led to a, a threefold increase in the adaptive potential of this trait. And when I looked at how the trait was changing phenotypically as a result of fluctuations in natural selection on the trait, I in fact found support for the models of maternal effect evolution that predicted that we ought to see accelerated phenotypic changes in response to this selection. Since this work was done, uh, an excellent student, Aaron McFarlane, uh, looked at maternal genetic effects on fitness itself uh, and found that most of the adaptive potential in this red squirrel population then lies in the maternal genetic component rather than the direct genetic component, suggesting that maternal effect evolution ought to be particularly common in this population, regardless of the trait that we might be interested in studying. Now, Maternal effects, though, are just one way in which individuals can interact with one another socially. Almost all individuals in nature interact 
with other individuals of the same species to some degree, either through collective foraging, huddling, aloe grooming, or in some form of a competitive environment, either through competition for limited resources like light, water, pollinators, or perhaps even mates. And so these sorts of social interactions are really quite common, but thus far we don't have a great understanding of how indirect of how these uh, social interactions can affect evolutionary changes in, in natural populations. And if we expand beyond simply the influence of mothers on, on their offspring and consider social effects more generally, we can define what are called indirect genetic effects, which is just a more general umbrella that encompasses maternal genetic effects, as well as all of the influences of through social interactions. So we can define indirect genetic effects then as phenotypic effects that are caused by the genes of other individuals. So now we have any individual's phenotype being influenced by its own genotype, as well as the genotype of some other interacting individual. Whenever this happens, uh, the social environment that organisms experience can contain genes and can evolve and contribute to the evolutionary process. It also reminds us that an individual's phenotype is not entirely its own. It's determined in part by the other individuals with whom it interacts. And importantly, these uh, genetic effects acting through other individuals through their social interactions can accelerate, slow down, or even in some circumstances, reverse the evolutionary response to selection. And as in the case of the maternal genetic effects, a lot of this depends on how these effect, genotypic effects are associated with one another. We call the effect of an individual's genotype on its own phenotype, the direct genetic effect. And so how these direct genetic effects are associated with indirect genetic effects can have a big influence on the overall adaptive potential of a particular trait. As a couple of examples of some work that has been done in the laboratory, Wilson et al. studied a form of aggression in deer mice, in dyads of deer mice placed together. And they found that the latency to fight was in fact heritable, but also experienced indirect genetic effects where an individual's genotype also influenced the latency uh, with which its social partner would uh, would attack it in an aggressive encounter. Importantly, in this example, these direct effects and the indirect genetic effects were positively associated with one another. And what that means is that individuals that had genes causing them to initiate fights quickly also had genes that caused them to elicit fights quickly from their social partners. And so these two factors tended to coincide with one another and uh, accentuate the genetic potential and lead to a tenfold increase in the adaptive potential of this trait. But this isn't always the case for traits like aggression. In a similar study of field crickets in the laboratory, uh, aggression was found to be heritable, to also um, uh, experience indirect genetic effects where individuals were affecting the aggression of their social partner. But in this case, these two effects were negatively associated with one another, where genes uh, enhancing aggression in a particular individual resulted in reduced aggression in their social partner. And so these two genetic effects then tended to cancel one another out in field crickets. And as a result, the adaptive potential of aggression in field crickets overall was completely eliminated. And so here we have two really nice contrasting examples of how uh, our understanding of the potential for a trait to evolve could be greatly overestimated or underestimated if we don't consider these social heritable effects on other individuals. Now these two examples might cause you to think that, um, that the relationships between direct and indirect genetic effects are really idiosyncratic and it might be hard to predict. And for the most part, that is the case, but there is uh, 
one scenario where I think we can make some reasonable predictions about how direct and indirect genetic effects ought to be associated with one another. When individuals compete for a fixed pool of resources, then any genetic effects that enhance an individual's access to that fixed pool of resources necessarily takes away from the resources available to a social partner. So anytime we have individuals competing for a fixed pool of resources, and anytime we have traits that are dependent on those resources for their expression, we might expect to see a negative association resulting between these direct genetic effects enhancing an individual's own access to the resources and uh, the negative consequences for their social partners. And so in these cases where we have competition for fixed resources, we expect to see a negative association between direct and indirect genetic effects. And under these circumstances, we might really overestimate the adaptive potential of a trait by ignoring these indirect genetic effects. And I think this has the potential to be quite generally important because fitness itself is at a certain level, a fixed resource that individuals compete with one another for. And if this is the case, or to the degree to which this is the case, then the overall adaptive potential in a population could be generally constrained uh, through these indirect genetic effects. And I'll just mention one really nice study by Costa y Silva et al. Um, that uh, demonstrates this in a population of uh, plantation population of eucalyptus where all of the trees in the population were pedigreed. So they knew how they were all related to one another. And <clears throat> what they found is that the growth rate of these trees was in fact heritable as we might expect with a moderate heritability following falling roughly midway between zero and one, uh, if we in fact ignore the social interactions of trees with their neighbors. But of course, this isn't the way the trees actually are. They are interacting with their neighbors through competition for fixed resources like water, nutrients, and sunlight. And as a result of this competition, faster growing trees shade their neighbors and inhibit their growth. And when these authors considered the indirect genetic contributions that a focal individual makes to the growth rate of their neighbors, they found that in fact, the genes for fast growth were associated with the creation of, of an environment that reduced the growth rate of surrounding individuals. And as a result, almost completely eliminated the adaptive potential of this trait. So we go from a trait that has a great capacity to evolve if we ignore the social interactions to uh, a, a, the reality of the situation given the social interactions that in fact the adaptation of this trait might be severely constrained. <clears throat> okay, so what do we know about the importance of IgEs to evolution in nature? Well, most of the examples that we have from natural populations involve dyadic social interactions, either between mothers and offspring or between two individuals competing for some fixed resource like access to a mate or social interactions between mates themselves. So for example, what is the influence of the sire on a female's laying date? <clears throat> but many of you might be uh, a little bit unsatisfied about thinking about social interactions in this kind of dyadic way. Most of the time when we think about social interactions, we think about much more complex, nuanced interactions about within large groups uh, of highly gregarious individuals occurring through social network um, uh, social interactions occurring through, through networks where uh, primary interactions are not the only uh, important social interactions that, that can occur. And so we have a little bit of a discrepancy then between 
um, the very complex network of social interactions that we oftentimes think about in gregarious situations and the relatively straightforward dyadic interactions that have been studied thus far. And uh, so we need to think about a way in which we can kind of bridge this gap a little bit. And this is where um, I found it quite helpful to, to use some of the work that we've been doing studying North American red squirrels as a bit of an intermediate between these very simple tractable examples um, having to do with dyadic interactions and trying to work towards more complex social interactions. And the reason that the North American red squirrel is tractable in this way is because red squirrels defend individual territories throughout their entire lives. And so in many ways, they're similar to those eucalyptus trees where we can characterize their social interactions with neighbors based on the physical spacing and separation of the squirrels from one another. Before I get too far along uh, in my description of our work with the red squirrels, uh, I need to acknowledge that we are a global community, a global audience here, and I need to differentiate our North American red squirrel from the Eurasian red squirrel that many of you might be more familiar with. Importantly, the North American red squirrel is exclusively territorial, whereas the Eurasian red has overlapping home ranges with one another. The North American red squirrel stores uh, conifer cones in a central cache or a midden, uh, whereas the Eurasian red squirrel tends to eat seeds and nuts in the places where they're found with some scatter hoarding that, that goes on. And, and unfortunately, our North American red squirrel doesn't have the beautiful ear tufts that your Eurasian red squirrel has. So uh, what I was interested in talking about for today then is to try and answer the question of how do social interactions affect traits and fitness of, of North American red squirrels in this natural population. And that's gonna be the goal of the rest of my talk today. So uh, all of this work is done through the Kluwani Red Squirrel Project, which is a, a long-term study of red squirrels in the Yukon Territory of Canada on the traditional territory of the Champagne and Asiac First Nations. This is a long-term study that was started by Stan Booten uh, at the University of Alberta in the late 1980s and is now led by Stan uh, Ben Dancer at the University of Michigan, Jeff Lane at University of Saskatchewan, uh, myself and, and Dave Coltman at, at the University of Alberta uh, as well. It's a long-term study of marked individuals where we followed a relatively large number of individuals through their lifetime, through a series of live trapping events and behavioral observations. From this, we can get uh, quite good measures of lifetime fitness. And we've put together a multi-generational pedigree where we know how all of the squirrels are related to one another. Importantly for this talk, we also know where individuals live and where their neighbors live as a way of trying to understand how they're interacting with those neighbors through social interactions. Importantly, red squirrels feed on the seeds of white spruce cones that it go through these pulses or mast events every four or five years. So these data represent the number of cones produced on about 450 trees spread throughout our study area where we've been tracking the availability of food for squirrels uh, across this 30 year study. And you can see that every now and then we get a bumper crop of cones for the squirrels, including a very large mast year uh, just last fall. But in recent years, we've also been able to quantify the number of cones that individuals have access to in their central cache of cones on their territory by using a sampling protocol of the number of cones in their middens. We follow squirrels by marking them with uh, unique metal ear tags and trapping them regularly on their territory. Once they've given birth, we climb up into the spruce trees and temporarily remove the pups from their nests. Females have litters of about three or four pups. And by the time they are three weeks of age, we can climb back up into the trees and permanently tag them as per adults. Uh, 
They stay on their mother's territory for about another month before they disperse away and need to acquire a territory of their own. The reason they need that territory is because they need a cache of food uh, to sustain them over the winter uh, in their first year. Importantly for this talk, red squirrels defend exclusive territories based around these food caches. They rarely physically interact with one another, uh, but they do still maintain social connections with one another through Zoom, Slack, and YouTube live streaming channels. Well, no, that's actually not the case. They communicate through territorial vocalizations that we call a, a rattle. So I've just got some audio recordings here of rattles if you're not familiar with them. And they use these rattles to defend their territory from one another, essentially signaling to another individual that I am still here, don't invade my territory. Now you might have been able to hear from those calls from two different individuals that they sound slightly different from one another. And we have done some bioacoustic analysis to, that indicates that they are in fact individually uh, distinct. So they defend exclusive territories. And so some might consider them to be very asocial, but what we would argue is that the defense of a territory in fact requires social interactions, that individuals cannot maintain physical distance without socially interacting with their neighbors. And so these are the social interactions that we've been quite interested in, in part because they're relatively simple and easy to decompose. So we know a number of things about how squirrels interact with their neighbors. We know that they use these territorial vocalizations to deter intruders. We suspect that these calls can be heard up to 130 meters through the forest. And so we tend to define an individual's social environment by all of the individuals that occur within this acoustically detectable radius. We know that squirrels can recognize their neighbors through their territorial calls and that offspring compete for uh, territorial vacancies within this uh, 130 meter radius predominantly. Some really nice experiments led by Ben Dancer also showed that uh, squirrels assess how many neighbors they have in their social environment and that females pre-program offspring through maternal glucocorticoids, pre-program them to be prepared for uh, the high density conditions that those offspring might experience when the mother hears lots of neighbors calling in her surrounding environment. So we're interested in extending uh, beyond simply the number of individuals in the social environment to try and explore whether the composition of that social environment also matters for the traits and fitness of, of red squirrels. And this really nice work was led by a wonderful PhD student of mine, Aaron Syracuse, who is now a postdoctoral research associate at uh, the University of Exeter. And what Erin was interested in studying for her PhD research was whether red squirrels are in fact influenced by the, their relatedness with their neighbors or perhaps their social familiarity with those neighbors. And so what Erin and her team did was to perform a series of temporary removal experiments where she took uh, an individual and temporarily removed, its from it, removed it from its territory. And as a result, it wasn't able to vocally defend its territory. And she then wanted to see how quickly neighbors came in to start stealing cones and which neighbors in fact were the ones that came in first. And so I've got a little video here that shows a neighbor coming in um, to start to steal cones from a midden of the temporarily removed owner. And this is the midden here you can see all of the cone scales remaining on the ground. So the neighbor comes in, takes a cone and runs away. A little while later, the neighbor comes back and steals some more cones. 
And this is the sort of pilfering that the owner is trying to deter through their vocal defense of their territory. And there goes that nasty neighbor. Now the owner is released from captivity and you'll hear it vocalize once it realizes that its territory has been intruded upon. Okay, so what Erin found as a result of her temporary removal experiments is that first of all, it doesn't take very long for neighbors to start uh, intruding and stealing food, about 55 minutes on average for ter territorial intrusions to take place. So red squirrels face this risk, constant risk of intrusion and pilferage that they need to defend against through territorial vocalizations. Aaron also found that kinship or relatedness with neighbors didn't seem to matter in terms of this intrusion risk, but familiarity with their neighbors certainly did. <clears throat> Individuals that um, were surrounded by relatively new neighbors faced a greater intrusion risk than individuals that had been uh, in their social environment for a longer period of time and were more familiar with their social neighbors. And this is consistent with what's referred to as the dear enemy phenomenon, which suggests that adversarial uh, territory neighbors ought to both benefit through the reduced territorial conflict or intrusion uh, through increased familiarity. So more fam familiar individuals ought to reduce their uh, territorial conflict uh, compared to less familiar individuals. And this seems to be the case for red squirrels. So individuals that are in less familiar social neighborhoods experience greater intrusion risk and most of that risk was coming from the least familiar of their neighbors. They were the ones that were most likely to intrude. Red squirrels respond to this variation in intrusion risk by adjusting their behavior. So Aaron investigated uh, about 1500 focal animal surveys of about 10 minutes or seven minutes in length and found that when red squirrels are in less familiar social environments, they spend more time rattling in defense of those environments and less time resting in their nests than individuals who are in more familiar social environments. So familiarity with your neighbors influences intrusion risk as well as the uh, behavior of, of red squirrels. But what was really neat is Aaron went one step further and looked at how this familiarity with neighbors influenced survival and reproductive success. And what she found were dramatically um, large influences of familiarity on both survival and reproductive success. So individuals that are in less familiar social environments have reduced survival and reduced reproductive success compared to their counterparts in more familiar social environments. What this suggests then is that there is incentive for red squirrels to maintain social cohesion through their lifetimes. If an unfamiliar neighbor dies, this comes at no fitness cost to a red squirrel because a new individual that comes in is simply replacing an old individual that was also unfamiliar. But these long-term neighbors that pose less of an intrusion risk are actually quite beneficial to an individual squirrel's um, survival and reproduction. And as a result, they ought to really benefit from the further survival of those long-term neighbors. And so Aaron was able to perform some calculations and the cost of losing a long-term neighbor to the fitness of a red squirrel is equivalent to the cost in terms of kin selection of losing a first cousin once removed. So there is some scope then for altruistic behavior towards familiar neighbors as a result of the benefits of these long-term social interactions. <clears throat> 
So what Erin found in her work then is that red squirrels surrounded by new neighbors face increased risks of intrusion. They spend more time defending their territory and they have reduced survival and reproduction. This suggests then that the composition of the social environment is important to red squirrels traits and fitness. And that there is some incentive then for red squirrels to reduce turnover in their social environment, despite having these antagonistic relationships with their neighbors. So what I wanna do next is to move on to a second study that was led by Dr. David Fisher, who was a postdoc in my lab, who is now a research fellow at the University of Aberdeen. And David was interested in trying to assess whether competition amongst neighbors for limited food resources could result in indirect genetic effects on the timing of breeding in red squirrels. Now, the timing of breeding or partrition date is an interesting trait to investigate in this, in this sense because it is both heritable, but it is also affected by resource levels. So when we've done food supplementation experiments in the, in the past, we can advance the timing of breeding by about two weeks by supplementing squirrels with food resources. So it's possible then that some of the heritable influence of uh, or on the timing of spring breeding is mediated through the ability of squirrels to acquire resources. It's entirely possible then in this territorial system that when red squirrels compete for resources and acquire those resources, they do so at the expense of their neighbors. And to the degree to which this is the case, then we would expect to see these negative associations between direct genetic effects and indirect genetic effects. So squirrels with the genes for being able to acquire more resources uh, would necessarily take those resources away from their neighbors and as a result have a negative uh, indirect genetic influence on their neighbor's resources and their neighbor's resource dependent traits like the timing of spring breeding. So what David did was to look at our long-term records of partrition dates, over a thousand records of partrition dates by uh, over 500 females over the extent of the project, but to no longer ignore the fact that those individuals are arranged in a particular spatial configuration. So what David did was to consider that those individuals are positioned within a population uh, where they have specific neighbors uh, surrounding them. So this is just a plot of the 99% kernel density estimates of territorial um, vocalizations of red squirrels in one part of one study area in, in one grid. And you can see that they defend these exclusive territories, but that they have interactions with neighbors at this acoustic scale. So in this particular analysis, David considered a focal individual's trait and the influence of the six nearest individuals uh, in their surrounding neighborhood. And what David found is that partrition date was in fact a repeatable trait. It didn't matter which squirrel we were looking at, but in fact, the timing of breeding of squirrels was more affected by the, ident the identity of all of their neighbors combined than it was due to the identity of the particular breeding individuals. So at least at the phenotypic level, these social influences exceeded the influences of an individual on its own trait. So clearly there are important social effects on the timing of breeding in red squirrels. David then took this analysis one step further to look at the genetic basis to these interactions to estimate direct genetic effects and indirect genetic effects. And he did this by linking these traits to our multi-generational pedigree for the squirrels. And what he found was first of all, that partrition, partrition date was heritable, um, consistent with what we've found in the past. Um, and he found what I would call, I guess, limited ev evidence, in fact, for the presence of indirect genetic effects. Under some circumstances, they were similar in magnitude uh, 
And we did in fact find evidence of this negative association between direct and indirect genetic effects. But there was a lot of uncertainty around these estimates and these only uh, seem to be important during high density years. In low density years where individuals um, were more physically spaced from one another, these interactions were in fact weaker. So what we learned from this experience then is first of all that partrition dates are in fact affected by social interactions with neighbors. The identity of an individual's neighbors matters in terms of when it breeds. <clears throat> that, um, that genetic effects that tended to advance breeding in the individual possessing those genes also tended to delay breeding in their neighbors. Although I would say this is only uh, weak evidence in support of this because there was a lot of uncertainty around these estimates and it only occurred in some years. And so in many ways, the take home message from this study was that despite a vast amount of data and really sophisticated analyses that David was able to perform, it looks like we're gonna face some pretty large challenges when we try and expand our understanding of indirect genetic effects in nature beyond dyadic encounters to consider the influences of, of multiple neighbors. The last study I wanna talk about is another study led by, by Dr. David Fisher, which sought to try and determine whether social interactions could in fact extend even beyond the direct physical interactions that individuals experience in the moment to include social interactions that might occur between individuals that in fact have never met. How this might happen is through extended phenotypes. Extended phenotypes being attributes of individuals that exist beyond their, their physical form or physical body. And the extended phenotype that we were considering in this case was the midden or the store of cones that, that, squirrels, that squirrels have and rely upon for survival and reproduction. Now these middens represent almost all of the energy that a squirrel has available to it to be able to use for survival and reproduction. They can contain well over 100,000 cones. And for reasons we don't yet understand, males tend to have larger cache sizes than females. And prime aged squirrels, meaning three or four year olds, tend to have larger caches than younger squirrels and very old squirrels. So individuals seem to differ in the sizes of their caches. Importantly, cones can last in the cache for over four years. And these middens are in fact traditional. So when one squirrel dies, the new squirrel that takes over the territory will in fact inherit the previous owner's cache. In fact, we have one midden on one of our study areas that has been defended for the past 31 years, but has been defended by 13 different squirrels that have sequentially owned that particular midden. So the question David was interested in asking then is whether squirrels are affected by the attributes of the previous owner of their territory, acting through this extended phenotype of the cache size that they inherited when they arrived in that territory. And what David found were really important effects of the previous territory owner. The predominant effect had to do with the sex of the previous occupant of the territory. So as I mentioned before, males tend to have larger cache sizes than females and squirrels that happen to inherit a territory that was previously owned by a male then had larger caches, about 1300 more cones than those that inherited a cache from a female. Uh, they tended to breed about two days earlier and in fact recruited uh, 0.6 more offspring over their lifetime than uh, individuals that inherited a territory that was previously owned by a female. So it seems quite clear then that squirrels can affect the resource dependent traits and fitness of other squirrels without ever in fact meeting in person, but can do so through this 
extended phenotype of the size of the cache that they then leave behind for the subsequent uh, owner. David tested for the presence of indirect genetic effects acting through the hoard size, but in fact found no evidence that hoard size was in fact heritable. And as a result, there was no capacity for indirect genetic effects to occur through hoard size. So here I've talked about three different ways in which squirrels are influenced by their social interactions with other squirrels. There are clearly important maternal effects in this system that can contribute to adaptation through maternal genes that affect offspring phenotype through maternal care. But red squirrels are also influenced by their social interactions with their neighbors, as well as these indirect effects acting through uh, an extended phenotype where the identity and traits of the previous owner of their territory can also influence the social environment experienced by a squirrel, despite never having met these previous territory owners. So it seems quite clear then that red squirrels, despite being uh, exclusively territorial and essentially hating their neighbors, they are engaged in quite a diverse array of social interactions that can have really important consequences for the evolutionary dynamics of their traits. So I hope I've convinced you as a result of this talk that uh, social interactions and indirect genetic effects are, can lead to complex and sometimes unexpected responses to selection and that simply considering an individual's own genotype on their phenotype misses out on a potentially important component of the process of adaptation and that we have much more to learn about the importance of indirect genetic effects to the process of adaptation in nature. In our work with red squirrels, we've learned a number of important lessons so far. That first of all, that social interactions are important for red squirrels in terms of their traits and fitness, even though they are solitary and most of the social interactions that they experience involve uh, physically distancing themselves from one another. Most of these social interactions with neighbors occur through their vocalizations and we're quite interested in the future of manipulating the information that individuals have access to by performing playback experiments that adjust the social information that's contained within those vocalizations. And finally, our uh, work looking at the inheritance of territories indicates that these social interactions can extend uh, to individuals that have never directly interacted with one another through an extended phenotype. If these general questions are of interest to you or if you wanna participate in further discussions of emerging issues in indirect genetic effects, I would point you towards the uh, American Genetic As Association's President's Symposium led by incoming President Kimberly Hughes, which will occur in Snowbird, Utah in November, either in person or if need be uh, virtually. And you can uh, find information online about this uh, symposium if it's of interest to you. And with that, I would like to thank uh, the funding sources that helped to support this long-term study. I would like to thank uh, Agnes McDonald and the Champagne and Asiac First Nations for allowing us to perform our work uh, within their traditional territories. Um, the work that I presented was the work of Aaron Syracuse and David Fisher, uh, but also the collaborators on the project have made important contributions uh, to these specific projects as well as the long-term study in general. And of course, none of this could have happened without the hard work of hundreds of field assistants who worked to collect the data over these years. And with that, I hope we are still live. I hope you are all out there and that there are maybe some questions for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. That was a brilliant talk, thanks. And um, so apologies and thanks for, for starting twice, essentially. Um, we have um, a number of questions. I'm going to straight head straight over to um, 
relaying some of them to you. Uh, so the first question is, is the vocal call an honest signal of the individual's quality and can neighbours distinguish between different call ca characteristics? I think you mentioned that they can recognise them. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, we know that they're individually specific and that they can discriminate between individuals based on their calls. Um, we don't know anything about honest signaling yet, um, but we do know that some aspects of physiological state are reflected in the calls, and that's particularly interesting to us right now. So calls from squirrels that have been recently released from a trap and as a result are experiencing acute stress have different bioacoustic properties than calls that are um, produced opportunistically uh, by squirrels in a less uh, stressed state. So, so we're quite interested in the capacity of squirrels to be able to use that information in, in a meaningful way. Right, right. I think I can link that with one of the questions is that yeah. you mentioned territory um, turnovers and there's one person asking whether that's exclusively through mortality or if, they, if squirrels can actually oust uh, another, another a neighbor essentially or not a neighbor and they might um, cue in on, on these things in the calls, right? If, if someone's yeah, like, oh, yeah. So squirrels will defend the same territory throughout their entire life under most circumstances. Sometimes females will bequeath their territory to one of their pups as a form of parental investment and the female, the adult female will then move on to a new territory and this does occur sometimes. Um, it is a long-term study and so it's always dangerous to say never because if you study something long enough, you do see very rare events and mm. it is extremely rare, meaning one or two instances of a squirrel being pushed off its territory um, in the 30 years that we've been studying this. So almost never does a squirrel get pushed off its territory by a neighbor, but they do face this persistent risk of pilferage and intrusion. Mm -hmm. I think I had a question, I think it's related to that. Um, you mentioned the, the kind of the cost of having, sorry, it was more beneficial to have more familiar uh, neighbors around. Is it possible to distinguish that from, um, you know, if there's just variation in territory quality and if, if low quality areas more frequently squirrels die and that looks like there's a cost of having unfamiliar new neighbors? Is that, yeah. is it, is that yeah. a part? Excellent question. And it's something that we've worried about for quite some time. And Aaron spent quite a lot of time trying to make sure that the results were not confounded by that because you might imagine that a low quality patch of habitat might enhance mortality which then leads to more frequent turnover, less familiar social environments and so on as you, as you described. And so her analyses were very careful to try and control for that, although it's very challenging to do that. So we actually don't see uh, spatial autocorrelation in uh, consistent spatial autocorrelation in metrics of fitness um, or in measures of familiarity. Um, and most of the um, important associations between familiarity and fitness components are within individual associations rather than among individual associations, which you would, the latter you would expect to occur if it had something to do with the particular place per se that the, that the squirrel was situated in. So it's something we cared a lot about and worried a lot about and, and it's a very good question, yeah. Yeah, well, it sounds like you, you did obviously do all the due diligence that one would expect yeah. as best yeah. as you can. Yeah. Um, got um, some, I think some of them we've kind of covered. Uh, some, sorry. <laughs> um, well, I think we'll, we'll take this one. To do different squirrel populations have different dynamics so that some populations will always have more turnover rate of neighbors than others, I think. Or maybe you've just covered that, sorry. But yeah, populations. there is something related to that that I think is really quite interesting because um, it, in, a, 
population that experiences more turnover, then we would not expect these fitness benefits of social interactions to be as strong. So, so in other populations, um, say where, where longevity is, is lower, we would not expect to see the buildup of these positive social interactions. And so there might be some really important population variations in the social interactions of the squirrels that we don't know about. So we have very detailed information about these particular populations in this one area, but how these effects change across the boreal forest of North America is, is completely unknown right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's a question on the, kind of the speculation, I suppose, of what would happen with more anthropogenic, anthropogenic uh, influence. So what might happen when forests are denser or, or loud sounds are continuously generated uh, in response to industrialization and the, the action of man, essentially? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess the, the short answer is that we don't really know. Um, one of the nice things of doing this work in Yukon, Yukon, Yukon territory is that there's very little in terms of disturbance in the area. Um, and so that's quite helpful for us, but how this social communication through vocalizations could be influenced by acoustic disturbance is not something like anthropogenic acoustic disturbance we don't, we don't really know about right now. Mm. Yeah. I was also wondering from a, from a, from a methodological perspective, I'm assuming um, these, these having these bust years with loads of, of um, food available is a bit of a nuisance, but I, I'm, sometimes my intuition uh, fails me. Is, is, is that the case? Would it be from an analysis point of view, would it be, would it be ideal if, if there was a bit more long-term stability and availability or is that, or does that actually um, introduce kind of interesting dynamics that, that give you hints at what's happening. Yeah, um, so when you said a nuisance, you mean like uh, logistically for us in terms of data collection or a nuisance for the squirrels? Uh, no, well, I guess for, for, for making sense of the data that you have. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. well, I mean, I, I laugh because um, that is probably our primary interest in the system are those dynamics. And for me, it is a wonderful combination of um, stability and dynamics. So the system as a whole has enough predictability to it that we can pull out some patterns, but enough variability to it that um, those patterns don't get boring to me as a scientist. There are constantly new things coming up and certainly uh, the world for the squirrels and for us in terms of our data collection gets turned completely upside down during these mast events. And there are all sorts of fascinating behaviors and life histories that emerge during mast events that we don't see in the non-mast years. And that, that's part of what keeps the system as a whole really fascinating. And, and so it helps to keep it fresh for us as scientists, but also it just reveals all sorts of new questions and new layers to questions that we hadn't considered before. So for me, it's a huge aspect of the system, which is really, you know, a big part of why, why it's interesting to us. Mm. I guess that's, yeah, that's you speaking with your ecologist hat on and, and me yeah, yeah. as a... Yeah. Yeah, lab, as a lab person. All right, yeah. I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, yeah. Thanks again very much for, for a fascinating talk. It was, it was a great pleasure to have you. And um, uh, for those of you who don't know, Andrew has uh, agreed to, to go through the questions in Slack maybe and, and, and tick off a few that I, I couldn't um, uh, relate to him or I, I, I didn't do a proper job on. Um, uh, so thanks, thanks again um, for coming. Um, our next talk is on Monday, and Professor Thomas Flatt will be talking about the genomic basis of adaptation along incline, inclines. Sorry. Uh, we hope you can join us again, um, same time, same place. In the meantime, keep your eyes out uh, for updates on Slack and on our Twitter feed. Um, have a great weekend, everybody, and until next time. Bye-bye. Thanks, Andreas.